This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 906, recorded on June 3rd, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses, Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon Depomier. Hello, Vincent and everybody else. Um, yes, it's two days away from uh, a big day for me. I will be turning 82 on June 5th. That's right. Happy birthday, Dixon. Oh, so I didn't do that <laughs> so you'd say it, but thank you. Um, it's on my calendar. I would have told you, yeah. I know. I, I get a, I get an email. I used to get an email from a guy who unfortunately isn't with us anymore. He was an Irishman, and he knew that my family came from Northern Ireland, and mm. uh, it was in Belfast actually. And this guy was a rabid Southern Ireland, let's say twenty one. What was it? Twenty five plus one equals one. Mm -hmm. uh, that's they want to reunite North and South. At any rate. He used to send me a little card on St. Patrick's Day, and on my birthday, he used to reinforce it on my birthday, and he used to say, happy birthday, you Irish bastard. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> he was like calling himself that, too, I, I presume, but uh, I enjoyed the banter between us, and so. Anyway. So you're going to be 80, 82, you said? 82, I'll be 82. Very good. 82. And the well, weather outside, by the way, just like her in passing. Uh, it's a very pleasant day, actually. The temperature's in the low 70s. Humidity is very nice. Um, my wife is about to go off to the opera for the evening, um, sans moi. And I will be home alone. You That's know, right. You can party. I, I, I don't know what the hell I'm going to have to eat for dinner. I do know that I will watch sports and I will <laughs> uh, enjoy myself. And... Um, yeah, like that. So there you go. Well, you can have a party, Dixon. You can drink heavily. You party can, of one. Uh, you can well, eat, you know, if I you know extensively, you could watch. You could binge watch anything you want. I, you know what I've been binge watching? <laughs> the Mandalorian. Have you seen that yet? Yeah, oh, it's yeah. very good. It's very good. Fantastic. I don't know what what how many there three seasons or something like that. I don't know. Let's I bring know, Rich in because 12, he knows. Also, also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. Um. Yeah, I don't know how many seasons. I think there was only two seasons of Mandalorian. I don't know. I think kind of diversified. There's, there's, a, there's a new things, one right? that's um. Well, be one can only. Boba Fett. Boba Fett, right and, right? and I haven't seen all of that one. There, there's even a new one from that. That's yeah, the Obi Wan Kenobi. So, I have work to do. I've it's 87 degrees in Austin, Texas, and sunny. It's um. Uh, more like what it should be this time of year, though we're going to looking at hundreds within a couple of days. But uh, right, right. this morning I was out canoeing on uh, nice. Lady Bird Lake with my grandchildren and went out to lunch, and here we are, and it's all good. And from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, it's 78 and sunny. There are two seasons of Mandalorian. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and... Um, Ending my first week of summer research with students and great to get back into it. I cool. like the music from the Mandalorian. It's very good. Yes. Right. I, I wish they'd use more good. lighting, however. <laughs> lighting? The whole thing is in like a twilight. Everything is like, you know, muted. So you don't get to see the details. And I think that's why they did that because they're saving money on CGI or something. I don't know. But I, I thought the story was cute. I'm, I'm waiting to see Yoda say his first words. <laughs> this, this guy guards Yoda and eventually gets him to his kind. And I have a feeling he's the only one left. That's what I think will happen. I don't know the true story. So, oh, you have, so you have not yet finished it? No. Okay. These are all the backstories to Star Wars. Yes, yes. That it, it is not Yoda. It is one of Yoda's kind, but not the oh, actual not Yoda. It's not Yoda. Yeah. They call it Baby Yoda, but it's not really. Yeah, they, they tell you his name eventually. Okay. Do. Oh, okay. yeah. It begins with a G, right? Mm -hmm. It's a weird right. name, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Okay, today we have an update for you on monkeypox. I have three articles for you, which we'll link to. We have a ProMed Mail update. We have a WSO sit rep. 
Uh, and we have an article in um, Science, and now someone has just put in um, MMW. Yeah, that was me. Uh, our, our, our friend Justin Moore um, uh, sent me this uh, MMWR link that just came out today, I think. Okay. Um, that's about uh, cases in the U.S. It's very good. So as far as I – I'll hand it over to Rich. As far as I can tell, there are more cases, maybe up to 700 according to the science article, um, mostly in men who have sex with men. Although I'm very I'm very hesitant to specify that because, you know, when, when AIDS first began, many people said, oh, you know, it's in gay men. Who cares, right, including the president of the U.S.? And then shortly afterwards, it was shown uh, to be in everybody else. So um, – I, I I worry when I say it, but that's the observation. Uh, just, and, just focus on the mainly because there are definitely cases outside yes, of that group as well. Yes, mainly. And then then most of them have no epidemiological connection to a rodent, right? Or some reservoir, some contact, uh, as have been the case with previous cases. Anyway, Rich, what do, what do you see happening uh, uh, recently? Uh, uh, similar. And I, I share your sensitivity to the men who have sex with men uh, thing. Uh, it does, uh, from all the reports that are going on, it does sound as if uh, at least there's a, uh, a focus of spread uh, mm -hmm. uh, in uh, that particular uh, population, okay? But it's very important to understand that, it's, uh, that this is a disease that does not have to be peculiar to mm -hmm. uh, uh, a particular subpopulation that what's really required for transmission is very close contact, okay? Mm -hmm. And that can be, uh, that can be just uh, skin contact. The, the, one of the, man, the ultimately the man, a main manifestation of this disease is these uh, postular lesions and they contain virus. Uh, and so if one of those uh, breaks or perhaps even not, um, but material from that contacts skin, broken skin, even microabrasions, uh, mucous membranes in another individual. That's a, a common method of transmission. But uh, also uh, body fluids, respiratory droplets for somebody who has a systemic infection will do it as well. What, uh, what about um, fomites? Yes. Um, you know, when, when I think about, when one thinks about smallpox, one thinks about things like, you know, bedding and blankets. Um, and so... Could there also be spread on inanimate objects um, yes. that have been contaminated with material from those pustules? Yep, there can be. Okay, um, so uh, it's it's very important to understand that it doesn't matter uh, what your uh, gender or orientation is. That um, you know, you could be infected, you could uh, transmit it. Are there um, any antivirals that work? Yes. Uh, so, uh, so in the U.S. Oh, first of all, let, let's do numbers of cases mm -hmm. because right, the right. science article that Vincent uh, uh, pointed out said uh, 700 confirmed or suspected cases as of what? 31st of May. Uh, and that's in many countries nationwide. Uh, I found this this uh, WHO uh, report that uh, has a table in it that is as of 26th of May. So that's five days earlier. And it breaks down, uh, it's got a nice table in it that breaks down confirmed and suspected uh, cases. And um, uh, so that's 26th of May, and it has 257 confirmed cases. This is globally. And somewhere in the range of 117 to 127 suspected cases. So I don't know where the 700 number comes so from. I think one difference is that this table is... Uh, specifically looking at non-endemic countries. Okay. Um, and I think maybe the science article includes the numbers of cases in okay. the endemic countries. Okay. Uh, if you look down the table, uh, the uh, there are several co uh, countries with one or fewer than 10 uh, ca confirmed cases. Canada, 26. U.S., 10. Netherlands, 12. Portugal, 49. Spain, 20. The UK, 106, okay? And the 
uh, MMWR article that just came out today, I don't know what the dateline on that is, except that it was uh, released today, uh, was 17 cases in the U.S., 16 of which are in uh, individuals uh, who have uh, uh, men who have sex with men. Okay. So that's a, uh, a preponderance in that particular circumstance. When they say um, that these are people without, uh, they, um, they, they say without a travel and a, a travel <laughs> history, that's, mm, that's a little weird. Okay. Because I, th the implication there is it's, I think what they're talking about is without a travel history to areas of Africa where the disease is endemic. Exactly. Okay. That's, and that's what I West think Africa and Congo. Yeah. Yeah. Many of these individuals uh, who, in the U.S. and elsewhere who are infected have traveled internationally. Okay, uh, and so I think that there is uh, uh, a component of international spread uh, at uh, uh, well, it's a fact at uh, uh, events that uh, feature men who have sex with men. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's very important that not only we be sensitive to this, uh, to the sort of uh, potential for scapegoating a population, but also that people be aware, people in particular uh, who could be involved, uh, be aware that this could be a problem because it can be mitigated by simply awareness and uh, appropriate uh, precautions. The it has an incubation period of it varies from like five days to two weeks, uh, but average of, of about a week. Um, and so there's an incubation period that's asymptomatic. To my knowledge, I believe it's correct that during that period there is not spread or tr uh, significant transmission. And the uh, transmission doesn't start to happen until you uh, start to have symptoms. The first symptoms are uh, n n uh, don't involve the rash, but are rather headache, malaise, fatigue, nausea, fever, et cetera. And I believe you can transmit virus during uh, that period of time. Uh, but within a couple of days after that, you start to get this rash and you can definitely transmit it from the rash. So that's going to help mitigate this. If people are aware that they're in a risk group, uh, if they're aware that they are engaged in activities that, propose, that uh, pose a risk, and if they're aware of what the symptoms are like, okay, if it's very important that that awareness be uh, communicated, then I think that there could be significant mitigation. Now, back to your question, um, uh, Dixon, uh, we have both vaccines and drugs for that were developed for smallpox, but they work against monkeypox. All right. And in particular in the U.S., uh, we have two different uh, vaccines that are currently in use. One is ACAM 2000, which is a, a vaccinia virus that's administered, uh, although it's plaque purified and uh, grown in cell culture. Uh, so it differs in that regard from the old calf lymph uh, dry vax uh, preparation. Uh, but it's nevertheless a live virus uh, suspension that is administered with a bifurcated needle in the tr traditional fashion. Um, so that's, uh, that's a traditional but a second generation vaccine. We have, I think, uh, millions of doses of that stockpiled. Uh, the downside to that is that it is prone to a certain uh, number of side effects. Uh, there was a, an effort uh, uh, some time ago to vaccinate all of the healthcare workers in the U.S. and maybe spread out from there, but they noticed in a small fraction uh, a myocarditis, and they decided to put the kibosh on that program. So that's one of several different uh, uh, adverse effects that can happen with that vaccine. The other vaccine is the MVA vaccine from uh, uh, Bavaria Nordic that goes by a brand name like Genlos or something in the U.S. I forget. I'd have to look it up. Uh, at any rate, there's like 24 million doses of that stockpiled in the U.S. And that is a, uh, a uh, genetically, it, that's a it's a live virus vaccine. You grow it, but it does not replicate in humans. It's so crippled. Um, and so you can't administer it by scarification. You administer it by injection. And is this monkey uh, specific, through. Rich? Excuse me? Uh, so it was developed for smallpox, but the uh, monkeypox is uh, closely enough related 
to right, smallpox. I, I meant in nature. No. The monkeys that get it, it goes across all kinds. In fact, it's only been isolated from monkeys a couple of times. <laughs> yes. Okay. The, 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 it gets called monkeypox because the first identification of it as a, a pox virus that is distinct from smallpox or other pox viruses was uh, in an isolation from a laboratory monkey in Copenhagen in 1958. Okay? A lab monkey, okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, it was probably imported. <clears throat> uh, that's my guess. Yeah, and right. thinking about it, that was at a time when smallpox was still endemic right. in a number of different uh, countries. And when when the methods available for differentiating one pox virus from another uh, were... Uh, more laborious. What, what, you know, you had uh, growth temperature on chorioallotoic membranes, whether or not it fused cells and culture, uh, maybe some serology, okay, but monkeypox is an orthopox virus, so it's uh, serologically very similar to both smallpox and um, uh, vaccinia. Uh, the natural uh, host is thought to be uh, a small mammal of some sort, probably a rodent. Uh, and I think there's been a couple of maybe isolations from a couple of rodents, but it's not a, it's not a well-defined population. Uh, the, most of the cases are in Africa, West Africa, and Congo, uh, and are thought to be uh, primarily zoonoses, where when people encounter uh, critters in uh, the wild, um, they can pick up this disease, but it can be transmitted human to human by very close contact. The, as we've said before, the West, there are two clades. The West African clade has a case fatality rate of less than 1%. And these cases that are coming up globally seem to be that clade. There's a Congo clade, a uh, Central African clade that uh, has a case fatality rate of more like 10%. But for some reason, probably having to do with a, a lower amount of travel in and out of that region, um, that uh, uh, infection has stayed put, okay? Uh, and there has not been uh, uh, um, cases of the uh, Central African uh, infection outside of Africa. So, so it's we, we're pretty lucky that monkeys are not susceptible to smallpox. Yeah. Oh, mean, yeah. It's not the reverse. It's not the reverse, right? Yeah. Uh, and you asked about drugs as well. There is a drug. I did, that, I did, yes. uh, There is a tecaviramat, I think is what it's called. Uh, this was a drug that was developed in response to the biodefense uh, efforts of the early 2000s following on the uh, 9-11. Uh, and this is a, a, a very effective drug uh, that's very well tolerated uh, that was developed by SIGA Technologies our friend uh, Dennis Ruby led that uh, effort. Uh, and I don't know if you remember Robert Jordan, but he was the chief sort of bench scientist involved. And they j- just did an outstanding job. Matter of fact, uh, uh, Rob Jordan was involved from the, he was the initial discoverer uh, in a company, small company called Virofarma, which uh, uh, closed down their R&D uh, uh, effort shortly after this was under development and SIGA Technologies acquired uh, uh, the grants, the license, the drug, and uh, Rob Jordan <laughs> and developed it from there and uh, took it all the way through uh, FDA approval. And I had, I was a fly on the wall for the, more than a fly on the wall, I participated in the FDA approval of that. Uh, so that was, and that was an unusual thing because uh, there have been no human clinical trials with this drug other than safety trials because you can't do them, okay? Because there's no pox virus infection you can do a trial with. So that was approved sure. under the uh, two animal rule. Enough efficacy was shown with various pox viruses and various animal models to ultimately convince the FDA uh, that this was uh, both safe and effective. And it's now stockpiled in millions of doses in the U.S., Okay. So nobody and it's has extraordinarily died from effective. This. Excuse me. Sorry. What? No human has ever died from this virus. Uh, no, yes. that's not true. There have been there there are uh, fatalities from both this clade and the Congo clade in Africa. So far in this outbreak, I do not oh. believe there have been any deaths. Yeah. So I'm looking at the science article right now, um, and it's 
the science article I think is a, a really nice article because it does point out that while we're sort of freaking out about this, um, this is something that uh, people have been dealing with in Africa for a while now. And um, we should <laughs> hear about their expert, listen to them about their expertise. And also maybe we should have been paying attention to how it was emerging in there uh, a bit more, but they, it specifically uh, notes that uh, Central African Republic has eight cases and two deaths, and Democratic Republic of Congo has 1,284 cases and 58 deaths. Wow. Um, Cameroon has 24 cases and nine deaths. Yeah, it's a lot. So it, it's not, it's not, or uh, the what's unusual about this is the apparent sexual transmission. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, because it's not thought of as uh, ordinarily a sexually transmitted virus, but this is uh, even a peculiar type of sexual transmission because it it's it's not really s sexual transmission in the classic sense of sexual transmission. We're not yeah. talking about fluids associated with sex. It's not in semen or something like that. I think we're probably talking about mechanical transmission yeah. associated yep. with sexual yep. contact. Okay, yeah. and. You know, these these are all, this is all really important because we have, we have, I, oh, actually one other little technical thing. This is, the incubation period is long enough so that you can actually, if you uh, know you've had a contact, you can actually get vaccinated shortly after you have a, a, a contact uh, and uh, uh mount sufficient immunity in time to at least ameliorate uh, the disease. Not once it's shown up, but after uh, contact. At any rate, so we got vaccines, we got drugs, but most important, we have understanding. And I think if, uh, if the population uh, at large uh, can be uh, educated as to what this is and how it's transmitted, I think education alone and appropriate precautions uh, can uh, snuff this out because it's not going to, we've been wrong so many times. <laughs> the rich, probability um, that this is going to get loose and spread in the same kind of way as SARS-CoV-2 is extremely low, I think. So I Rich, think you it, can transmit before you get a rash, right? I believe so. And But you do have to be symptomatic to transmit? That's my understanding. Okay. 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 I, uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving room to be wrong here. Yeah, I understand. Uh, but, but my understanding is that uh, uh, before you are symptomatic, let's put it this way, the likelihood of transmission is low. Yeah. Okay. And maybe, maybe nil. And that there is a prodrome. So there's an incubation period where nothing is going on. There's a prodrome that's before you have a uh, distinguishing symptoms, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. symptoms that are like fatigue, as yep. I said, yep. Uh, yep. nausea, headache, a fever, et cetera. And I believe that during that period of time, uh, you can transmit. Um, and then, of course, there's the rash. And you can, once that shows up, you're definitely contagious. Yep. Does the so vaccine this, play any role in Africa? I don't know. That would be a question for, uh, we are talking WHO. before the show, for Inger. Yeah, okay, there, okay. there is a paper um, and I mostly know about the paper because I use one figure from it and uh, when I teach and I have seen this figure online um, as people have been talking about this where they look at um, monkeypox cases in people in different age groups. Um, and it's pretty clear that most of the monkeypox cases in endemic countries are in people who are um, young enough that they did not get the smallpox vaccine. Mm -hmm. And so at least part of the reason for emergence and increasing numbers of cases is because people are not getting vaccinated. Um, the smallpox vaccine may have been partially protecting people against monkeypox in the past. And now that we don't vaccinate, there are more people getting um, infections. So there is that kind of role for vaccination. And whether, whether vaccination is used as a a preventative measure to any significant degree in Africa. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. okay. It's, uh, it says in this article, um, Africa lacks medicines to prevent and treat monkeypox. So it sounds like they don't have access to vaccines or antivirals, although right. at least in Central African Republic, a trial uh, it, of tecoviramat is ongoing since 2021, and 14 people have received the drug. 
So uh, I think in a country in a country where there are 1,284 cases and one percent fatality, uh, that might that might warrant a vaccine, especially. So the, if this paper, Placid Mubala, who's a virologist in Kinshasa, says demographic shifts had have fueled the rise in cases. He says he or she says people are more and more moving to the forest to find food and to build houses. And this increases the contact between wildlife and population. So he said, studies have shown that there's a spike in cases after villagers move into the forest during the rainy season to collect caterpillars that are sold for food and they get in contact with rodents. So it seems like those people would be a good target for vaccination, right? Yeah, I think we should try to see if they can get some of the MVA vaccine that Rich mentioned. Yeah. Um, having had a CAM 2000, I wouldn't, not sure I would wish it on anyone. Um, <laughs> but uh, if the other one is, uh, uh, has less side effects, then sure. You know, this is a situation where there's an, enough stockpile of both the, uh, yeah, sure. the Bavarian Nordic, the MVA vaccine, and the drug so that we could well afford to help out another country with this, it seems to me. Agreed. So th this article is called Global Outbreak Put Spotlight on Neglected Viruses by John Cohen. It basically says another neglected tropical disease of the poor gets attention only after it starts to infect people in wealthy countries. No question. And Yap Boom, an epidemiologist in Cameroon, says it's as if your neighbor's house is burning and you just close your window and say it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, that's uh, uh, that's important. That's an important perspective. Yeah. Uh, one more thing from this article, Rich. It says it, it, the virus appears to be common in squirrels, rats, and shrews, occasionally spilling over into humans, where it spreads mainly through close contact, but not through breathing. Well, so I mean, if you're close, if you're within a foot or two, you can spread it by breathing. Is that the respiratory idea? Respiratory droplets. So if you're okay. on the other side of the room, you probably won't. Transmitted? I uh, I think that's the case. Okay? okay, this gets into this whole thing that we've been doing for <laughs> years about aerosol versus airborne versus respiratory droplets, and none of this stuff is black and white, right? Yeah, of it's, course. Uh, it's all shades of gray. But my understanding is that this is a situation where, let's put it this way, it's not going to be nearly as transmissible uh, indirectly or through the air as SARS-CoV-2. I think you probably basically have to exchange saliva with somebody or have somebody sneeze in your face or something like that uh, in order to transmit this. That that sort of close contact. Genuine have a genuine respiratory droplets coming coming out of you rather than six feet away or whatever. So in the UK, you may know that uh, healthcare workers are being offered uh, vaccines and uh, recommended to wear face masks. What do you think about that? Uh, yeah, makes sense to me. For a healthcare yeah. worker, right? For a healthcare worker, yeah. Who's in contact uh, yeah, with a lot uh, of know, people I mean, in if a you small look room. At, look at the chart from the from the WHO, and uh, half of these cases, or at least half the cases that WHO reports outside of Africa, are in the UK. Okay, mm -hmm. so... There's a certain probability uh, currently that that could happen. So I would want to give him the Bavarian Nordic vaccine, I think. Yes. Following on Brianne's, um, you know, ACAM 2000 works, but it is associated with some risk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, and I want to have a lot of Tecaviramat on hand. I, I think that's, yeah, yeah. Uh, that uh, its day has come uh, because uh, it could be quite useful in this. Yeah. Uh, of course, a healthcare worker in a close room, touching patients, right? Those are the conditions for yeah. transmission. So they should in, they should be probably vaccinated and face mask. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's uh, move on to our snippet, which is a paper in Scientific Reports: Detection of Mimi Virus from Respiratory Samples in Tuberculosis Suspected Patients, and. Uh, have a very long-standing interest in giant viruses. And um, so this caught my eye. This is from a group uh, in, the, in the Pasteur Institute of Iran. And a, a, the Artificial Intelligence and Multiomics Center in Norway. And Mimi virus, the giant 
virus, the first giant virus discovered uh, in 2003, accidentally discovered. Um, the, the story goes it uh, came from a patient with uh, a suspected, what was it, an eye infection and uh, a respiratory. I don't even remember, but the, they looked at it under the microscope. It was big. They said it's a bacterium, so they put it in the freezer for 10 years. And then huh. 10 years later, someone pulled it out and said, oh, this is a virus, actually. And they found that it can infect amoeba, bigger than any virus that had been discovered to date. Now it's, of course, dwarfed by other giant viruses, but dwarfed. the first one. Uh, yes, dwarfed. Um, <laughs> so and then we have subsequently other related viruses, Mimi virus, Moly virus, Fausto virus, Marseille virus, Pithoviruses. I like... They, they left out mama. They, so they go Mimi and then mama and then Mumu viruses because the French just love to make jokes with their nomenclature. And you may remember, Rich, at the giant virus meeting, uh, Matthias Fisher wrote a song and sang it about Mimi and mama to the <laughs> tune of, of uh, what is that? Uh, uh, Bohemian Rhapsody. Bohemian Rhapsody, oh, yes. yeah. Mama, I was a giant virus. I have, to, I have the lyrics. And he said he would send us a recording so we could play it. We have to do that. I, was, yeah. I loved it when he did that. That was just great. So these infect amoeba. At least they can infect amoeba in the lab. The question is, do they infect people, right? Whenever you have a new virus, you want to know if they're infecting people. There have been scattered reports. You know, it's not quite clear. And so this one, they, they have looked at it. And I thought we'd look at it just as an example. Um, the thing about this is that amoeba live in water, can live in water towers, right? And Legionella live in amoeba, and that's how they get into people sometimes. And so why not Mimi viruses by the same route, right? Uh, and so they have this cohort of patients with suspected tuberculosis. They have 10,166 patients. These are in Iran from April 2013 to December 2017, and they have sputum and nasal respiratory samples, including sputum and bowel, bronchoalveolar lavage samples, they extract DNA and RNA, and they do some PCR, and they do some sequencing. So 10,166 TB suspected patients, four were PCR positive for Mimi virus, and they sequenced the products, and they're clearly Mimi, Mimi viruses. Now, the authors say we're infected with Mimi virus. I don't think that's correct to say that. We don't know if they're infected, although when you go through the case histories, it's tantalizing, but um, let's uh, let's... I think you need to, to culture out virus before you can say that. Yeah, I, I really wanted to know. I was like, okay, but do they also have amoeba? Yeah, right. Somehow infected. You know, is, is the virus in an amoeba or is it actually in the human cells? Right. So we have four it's different patients. It's not systemic, though. The, the amoeba is not systemic. <clears throat> it's located in the central nervous system. So, well, in these patients, it would be in the lung, right? Uh, well, these, these are patients with respiratory disease. Yeah, but it I can't, can't go in your brain. Yeah, it doesn't live there. That's all I can say. Well, that particular one causes the brain infections, right? Correct. But these maybe a different amoeba is doing lungs, right? Because that's how Legionella. Uh, it's a lung infection. It comes Vincent, along. We would know that by now. In fact, uh, Entamoeba <laughs> histolytica actually does infect the lung. Yeah. But there are very few other. Strangers to the lungs that are amoeba. So I'm sure if you're looking for a, a reservoir for the virus in a host, who you're, you're creating a Russian box situation where, you know, does the amoeba harbor the virus and then does the, I don't know, the <laughs> extracellular plasma cells that surround the, the alveoli harbor the amoeba and the virus. It's, I think that's not true. So you'll have to find either a host cell that the amoeba virus is uh, infectious for. Oh, yeah, sure. You would like to get or, sections and stain them. You you know, you yeah, 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 they, yeah, they yeah. complain that, well, we couldn't grow the virus, so we couldn't make antigens for for making antibodies for staining. How did staining. they get the virus out of the lungs? Did they lavage it? Well, there's some bowels and some uh, some nasal swabs, yeah. 
Oh, nasal swabs. So nasal swabs or bronco alveolar lavage. And then, it's, and then it's PCR. And then PCR. And then it's PCR. Okay. So we don't have virus. We have sequence. We have sequence. And so four patients each. With, and, and the interesting thing is when they sequence it, they can do the phylogeny. And these are all lineage C. So the Mimi viruses occur in lineage A, B, and C. They're all lineage C. And previously, people have suggested human infections, and they've been lineage C2. So that's interesting. Four patients where they found PCR positivity, in three of them, culture and PCR were negative for all agents involved with pneumonia, bacterial, fungal, and viral agents, except one patient had Legionella infection. Ah. So we have, we have a 25-year-old uh, woman with renal disease who had pneumonia, negative for all pneumonia agents. They gave her azithromycin, but she didn't really respond. Right. Then the 64-year-old diabetic man who had pneumonia, uh, hmm. again, all pneumonia agents negative, again, including mycobacterium, right? Sure. By the way, the CT values for these patients, the first one I told you uh, was 22, and this one was 18 to 20, which is respectable, right? right. It's not huge. And then we have a 40-year-old man with HIV, okay? And so uh, this person is, is immunosuppressed. He's actually admitted for pneumocystis treatment. Uh, and these people have mechanical, they're being mechanically ventilated, uh, which may be a risk factor because the hospitals have water towers, right? <laughs> so of maybe, maybe it's somehow getting into the circulation. So this uh, young man had CT values of 19 to 21. And again, all neg negative for all pneumonia agents. And then the last patient is a 12-year-old boy with cystic fibrosis. Wow. And uh, had pneumonia, all negative for, for uh, agents, except he, he had Legionella. And this patient died. Unfortunately, CT values of 21 and 27. So uh, I would say these are interesting. First of all, if in fact they're, they represent infections, the incidence is low, right? It's four patients out of 10,000, right? Yeah. And that's 10,000 people who have symptoms. Yeah. So, you know, the exactly. incidence is even lower if you actually look at all people walking around. And all these people survey, have- Sarah, survey in somebody's future. Maybe, yeah. And all these people have underlying diseases, right? So maybe the healthy people don't get it. Yep. I don't know. Uh, but I have to point out, there have been a number of studies where they don't find it. And they talk about this in the discussion. They say, well, maybe there's small sample sizes. 0.04% in TB-suspected patients. And they conclude further studies are necessary to confirm the role of Mimi virus pathogenicity in humans. <laughs> I would say yes. yes. I, one thing I was thinking about with this is that for some reason over the past, I don't know, two years or so, I feel like there might be a lot of um, nucleic acid from people with respiratory disease that might have been collected um, <laughs> that might be, you know, hanging around in a few different places. I wonder if some you of that could like, be subjected yeah. to. In the order of millions, right? Yeah, exactly. You think about how many samples yeah. have to be out there somewhere. Um, yeah, yeah. Some of it may have been subjected to isolation that would let them look at DNA viruses. What a Could, thought, Brian. Some of that be PCR. Yeah. Wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be great if uh, there had been or, or is somewhere an effort to actually stockpile all those samples mm -hmm. as a resource? Yeah. Or, that could give you, you know, some more... sort of metagenomic sequencing of all of those samples so that then you can stockpile the information on a computer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that would be really cool. And that could address some of this about people with respiratory symptoms mm -hmm. and general prevalence. Yeah, that would require someone, I think on most people, giant viruses don't, are not on their radar. Right. right. And they would have had to extract not just RNA, but they yeah. would have had to look yeah. for DNA. It costs money to do this. And yeah. So I think that's a great idea, though. They should really do that. Um, well, I'm glad this is a... Uh, uh, pretty extensive, pretty big study, and I'm yeah. glad it's there because the yeah. question is yeah. out there, and this is relevant data. These are relevant data. But I think, look, this is this is a Nature Journal. The reviewers should not let them say these people are infected with Mimi virus. It's not appropriate. It's nucleic acid, and it's a difference. Right. And some people get it, and other people don't. Um, what was I going to say? One more thing. Hmm. 
Mimi virus. Oh, um, I, so at the last giant virus meeting, someone was talking about the the very broad tropism of these giant viruses. They they infect all kinds of things. And so at lunch, I asked Michael Rossman. No, not Michael Rossman. No. Uh, the Russian guy from the NIH, Eugene Koonin. Oh, Koonin. <laughs> they both have similarly cranky personas, you know? <laughs> Unfortunately, Rossman, Rossman died. And that's not crusty. a negative. Crusty. 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 Let's say crusty. Because I'm cranky too, right? Um, so yeah, I you're asked, cranky. You aren't crusty. You're cranky. I'm just cranky. Um, <laughs> well, someone told me the other day, that, that a listener said, I even like you when you're cranky, she said. Okay. Great. Um, so I asked uh, Kunin, does Mimi virus infect people? She says, of course, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no? He said, he's just been found in, and this is the data, basically, this sort of thing. So I'm not sure it's definitive, but I thought we would uh, chat about it. Cause it's so we did, a, we did a paper some time ago uh, that had, um, uh, who's the guy in Illinois? The guy in Illinois. Yeah, he's a pox virologist with chlorella virus. Oh, you're talking about uh, the guy in Nebraska. Nebraska. Yeah, Close that's um, Jim <laughs> Van Etten. Jim Van Etten, yeah. Boy, Rich and uh, I have problems I know, yeah, this is really coming well, to pieces here. So on, anyway, Brian, you've got to pick uh, up. We, we I get, don't know who uh, the person in Illinois slash Nebraska is. Well, it's Nebraska, it's Jim Van Etten, yeah. yeah. What did he say? Not only do I not know the name, I don't actually know where he is, right? I do know <laughs> this stuff, but I can't recall it. Anyway. Then we, we did a paper uh, of his some time ago that was about oh, a right. giant virus infection in brains, right? In Baltimore, yeah. Oh, they were claiming it altered the behavior. Yes, that's right. Yeah, 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 yes. Oh, Ooh. yeah, I remember that. That, uh, you know, there's never been any uh, extensive substantiation of that. No. But it's, uh, it's out there. Uh, Side note, getting back to acanthamoeba as the uh, the host cell or the Trojan horse that gets it inside the host, at least. Yeah. Um, when, when they first had their first cases of uh, acanthamoeba, they thought it was a virus instead of a, what it turned out to be. So they took brain tissue from a freshly um, dead patient, unfortunately, and they put it into a tissue culture. And they were looking for a plaque assay, Rich. And when they came back the next day, they didn't find any plaques, but they found these gigantic holes in the auger. And they looked again, and they, they couldn't believe what they were seeing. And actually, the acanthamoeba were eating the uh, cells in the culture. <laughs> <laughs> That's black. Oh. You wait another day, there wouldn't be any cells <laughs> left at all. That's then, a black. Where yeah. the hell did they go? <laughs> you know? That's pretty amazing. Huh. Yes, quite amazing. Interesting. Okay, fine. And our paper for today is Nature Medicine, Long COVID After Breakthrough SARS-CoV-2 Infection, uh, Al Ali, Bo, and Xi. And these authors are from um, the VA St. Louis Healthcare System, Department of Medicine, Wash U, Washington University in St. Louis, um, and, and a few other places in St. Louis. And this has been making... The, the media rounds, so I thought we would talk about it because I don't think the media interpretation is actually <laughs> the correct interpretation. This is open access too, right? I think it's open yeah. access, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, I can get the whole article on my computer. All right. Post-acute sequelae, also known as long COVID. So PASC, post-acute sequelae of, of COVID or long covid we, we have this, we haven't really talked about it all that much. We've mentioned that it exists. And in this paper, they want to know if you are vaccinated right. or, and, and then you get infected. They call it breakthrough. But I su su sincerely dislike that phrase because it implies something is wrong. And it's an infection because, as we know, and as we have said many times here on TWIF, vaccines after a certain period of time do not prevent infection. They prevent you from getting seriously ill. Nevertheless, they use BTI as not, a thing. Not only do I dislike the phrase breakthrough infection, I dislike the BTI as an abbreviation even more and yeah. had to go back and try to figure out what BTI was. 
I know. many times. It's bacon, tomato, and um, <laughs> something. <laughs> yeah. And the something. question is whether people with so should we say BTI or should we say post vaccine infection? Yeah, but post vaccine infection experience post acute sequelae is not I like clear. That. That's PVI. PVI How about post that. Vaccine, That's yeah. also the pox virus invitational golf tournament. <laughs> PVI. <laughs> Whether people with PVI have long COVID. And they did this by querying the electronic health record databases of the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. And right away, you got to know it's not a lot of young people in this data set. <laughs> and okay? not a lot of women. And very few women. 90% male. Yeah. So to make general conclusions right off the bat, difficult. Yeah, so I, when I look at this, because I, I spent a lot of time thinking about the extended data um, where they're trying to look at different cohorts and different comparisons and trying to decide for myself, well, which comparison did I really think was the important one? Um, and the benefit to this um, is that they get to have a lot of people. Yeah, right. Um, and so it's a large number, but the, the negative is that it's older people, um, it's mostly men. Um, and one of the things that I looked at a lot in this paper, I thought about a lot, was that they're sort of saying, do you have um, post-acute sequelae? Um, but they don't have the ability to say, how bad is it? Mm. Yes, I think that's a problem. A lot of this is questionnaire-based. Yes. And the main symptom is fatigue. And that raises flags, right? Because, yeah, you have, especially if you're old and you have COVID, you're probably going to be tired. Yeah, I think <laughs> that's the bottom line. In fact, as we'll see, if you were vaccinated, you got infected, and you ended up in the hospital or even on a ventilator, then you have issues. Not surprising, but people who don't up in, end up in the hospital really have much less long COVID. Anyway. So that's uh, the other thing is that there's uh, in this there is no distinction between uh, a primary series of two vaccinations and uh, boosting. That's right. Okay. Right. Correct. Uh, in fact, uh, the the definition of vaccinated in this is at least two doses of either of the mRNA vaccines or one dose of the J and J vaccine. Okay. So we don't know right. what effect, if any, boosting That's has. right. Oh, by the way, Dixon, Rich, and myself are now no longer considered fully vaccinated unless you guys have gotten your fourth dose. I, I have know. not gotten my fourth dose. I have not had my fourth so, dose. So Rich and, and Dixon and I are now longer fully vaccinated. Can you Is imagine? Is that right? Hmm. CDC announced that this week. Yeah. Hmm. Ah. And I just wrote Paul off it. And I said, can you come on and twiv and ask and explain why we have to get, I don't want to get a fourth dose. I don't see the data. Anyway, sorry, I diverge. Um, the CDC has been wrong before, though, by the way. Let's just note that also. Yeah, I understand. Uh, so they said they wanted to look at magnitude of risk for long COVID in people with uh, PVI versus those who got SARS-CoV-2 infection without vaccination. And then a separate cohort of hospitalized people who had influenza, do they get post-viral PVI? So I want to uh, make sure we're clear on some definitions <laughs> no, here. because I not PVI if they got PASC. But, Sorry, oh, PASC. PASC. Thank yes. you. Thank yeah. you very much. PASC is good. Um, uh, oh, yeah, PASC. Yes. At any rate, I want to, uh, I struggled with some of these definitions. And so I want to yeah. make sure I got it right. Uh, and check it out with you guys. First of all, long COVID, uh, or uh, what are we calling it? Yeah, Pask. 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 Okay. Um, their definition, if I understand it correctly, is symptoms, and there are a variety of different possible symptoms, including fatigue, that occur uh, within a window of time between 30 days and six months after... Mm -hmm. The original infection. Correct. Okay? Yes. Um, and they do kind of, sort of, a little bit break that down later in the paper. We can get back to that. Uh, yeah, I mean, they, uh, they look later a little bit out to 180 right. days. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think I was talking to somebody else recently, and uh, uh, 
uh, definitions of, uh, of long COVID differ. Some people specifically say 12 weeks. Yeah. You got symptoms at 12 weeks. Well, the, there are people in this that would be scored with long COVID, uh, that may, uh, be symptomatic 30 days after and not 12 weeks after. Okay. So the, keep in mind what the definition is. Just because you're symptomatic 30 days afterwards, by this paper you're uh, uh, defined as having long COVID. It could be that six months from then you're fine. I don't know. That, yeah. That's not really specified. Yeah. The other thing I had trouble with was defining the co cohorts. I came back to this numerous times. And in the supplementary da data, there's a figure eight. That's the flow chart of the cohorts that finally sorted this out for me. Mm -hmm. They have a historical control that are basically uh, records from individuals pre-COVID that right. include 6 million individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they have uh, their uh, uh, contemporary uh, group that are uh, users who were alive on January 1st, 2021, 5 million people. All right. Um, and they break those down into individuals who were vaccinated uh, before enrollment. And that's the vaccinated control. Right. And then they have individuals. Um, oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, there were uh, of the 5 million people, there were uh, 300,000 who had a positive uh, test before January 1st, mm -hmm. leaving uh, just a little uh, 5,140,000, okay, of people who have no record of a SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, but are alive on January 1st, 2021. Mm -hmm. Right. That includes ultimately people who were vaccinated, but those – all of those people, vaccinated or not, are what they can tall, call their contemporary control. Okay? So the contemporary control includes both vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals, but people who have uh, never, have no record of having COVID. Right. Then they split out from that another group that they look at specifically, which is the vaccinated control. Um, and uh, that becomes important. So uh, and then, of course, they got people who had PVI, post-vaccine infection, what they call breakthrough infection. That's another group. And then, as you mentioned, the seasonal influenza group. Mm -hmm. Right. That's it. Oh, Good. It's they complicated. Also, they also do have some people who are infected but who are not vaccinated. That's right. Yes. That's right. So, at any rate, if, you're, if you try and read this paper and you get confused about it, go to figure eight the flowchart yeah. that defines all those groups and that helps a lot. Now, one of the one of the numbers they come with here early on during the enrollment period for this uh, people were getting vaccinated people were getting infected, right? Just a long period of time. It's 10%. That's the the rate of PVI among fully vaccinated during the enrollment period. 10% per 1,000 persons at six months. So that's pretty good, right? Infection. That's just infection. any infection. Mm -hmm. So that means the vaccines are 90% effective. Yes. <laughs> effective right. still at this uh, preventing actually infection, which is re really good. Uh, this is, of course, uh, January 2021 to October 2021. So this is pre Omicron, right? All right. So two measures of risk. First, the hazards ratios, and they're comparing people with PVI versus their control. And then the adjusted excess burden of each outcome due to PVI per thousand persons six months after a positive SARS-CoV-2 test based on the difference between the estimated incidence rate in people with PVI and the control group. So hazard ratios and excess burden. That's what we're going to be looking at. Mostly I'm going to tell you hazards ratio because that, you know, if it's a 1.5 hazard ratio, you're what, 0.5 more likely to get to have something, right? Is that the so right this, way to Yeah. Look? And so this well, is 1.5 times as much, but one times, times as, as much as the same. So right. this, this, these first 
these first data are what I had trouble getting my head around in terms of groups. We're comparing symptoms of long COVID right. in a group that's been infected. We're comparing that to a group that has no evidence of a SARS-CoV-2 right. infection. Right. That's okay? right. Okay? Right. Uh, and that group, half of them are vaccinated, half of them are not. Okay. Right. And so, so really, you know, the question that this is asking is, does vaccination, while it may not prevent you from having an infection, does vaccination prevent long COVID? Right. All right. So let's go through these numbers. First of all, they're looking at death. Uh, people who survive the first 30, 30 days of a PVI have a hazard ratio 1.75 of death, an increased risk of death, 1.7 times more likely to die. And then the excess burden of death is 13.36 per thousand persons. That's excess per thousand persons. These are all PVI at six months. So if you have a PVI, if you've been vaccinated, you have a PVI and you, you, can, you have an increased risk of death. Right. Okay. So I'm I'm okay with that, especially given the age, right? The cohort is quite old. Yeah, I'm just looking at this now because that came to mind. There's uh, there also uh, there is part of the supplementary information is a spreadsheet or a, right. a workbook right. that's got uh, huge, 23 huge. tables in it. Yes. <laughs> uh, the only one I paid close attention to was table one. And the uh, average age of the PVI group is a uh, little over 66 years. Right. The SARS-CoV-2 infection group, 58 years. Contemporary control, uh, that's uh, all of the people, that's f almost 5 million people. Uh, 63 years. The vaccinated control, 67. The historical control, 62. So this is, you know, this is uh, in the age group where you're uh, on average, there, are, it's almost as if on average they're high risk. Not quite. I think the cutoff yeah. is sixty-five. That's right. Uh, but uh, but pushing it. Yeah. And so once think, again, ninety percent male. And I think for the press to conclude vaccination does not prevent long COVID is wrong because <laughs> this is not a general group of people, right? It's very specific. Okay, people with PVI also had increased risk of having at least one post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2, hazards ratio 1.5, right? And so what are those? Oh. Uh, pulmonary, hazards ratio 2.48, so that's a bit higher. Extra pulmonary organ systems, cardiovascular, 1.74. Coagulation and blood disorders, 2.43. Fatigue, 2. Twice as likely to be more tired. Gastrointestinal, 1.63. Kidney, 1.62. Mental health, 1.46. Metabolic, 1.46. Musculoskeletal, 1.53. Neurological, 1.69. I would like to know how they di determine this, right? <laughs> Actually, uh, I, I'm what, sure it's here in the methods. Let me look ahead because it's probably mostly survey. So if it's a survey and not based on a diagnostic test or a medical record, then I think it's problematic. Um, I, mean, I think that, you know, I know that you've mentioned the fatigue um, being – yeah. A question mark. I'd be more interested in knowing how they diagnose coagulation and hematologic yes. and pulmonary because those two come up as the most frequent of the post-acute yeah. sequelae. Now, I have a of, feeling some of these for, must be laboratory tests. I have a feeling it says on the on the medical record, you know, this person has yeah. this blood disorder, right? So they throw it in there as a post-acute, and you know, it's association, right? <laughs> Right. I don't know. I just don't know what that means. All right. So then going a little further than 30 days, as Brianne mentioned, risk of death increased in the 30 to 90 days and also in the 90 to 180 days, but less uh, less so. And the, the risk of sequelae increases after 30 days, right? Between 30 and 90 and 90 and 180 days, but becomes less and less as you go forward in time, which suggests to me, well, so if you go forward a year or two years, 
what does it look like? Because at the end of this article, they really freak out about being infected at all. And they say, we basically have to stop all infections. <laughs> and I'm not sure that that's the right outcome based on this, right? Does that make sense, what I'm saying? It, yeah, I think that, I guess I read some of the press takes on this a little bit differently um, because I read the press takes as, okay, getting vaccinated doesn't mean you're 100% protected from long COVID, that you, it's still a possibility. Um, and, and I think that that's what the data say. Yeah, it's still possible. It's maybe less likely, um, especially when you go into the next figure. Um, I think that the next figure does argue that it's less oh, likely yeah. after yeah. vaccination. Um, and like I said, it, they also don't talk about how severe are the sequelae. So maybe, for example, your long COVID is not as bad. Yeah. Um, you can't tell from this. But the idea that just vaccination does not give you 100% protection from long COVID um, I think the paper supports. I think that's fine. I agree. But yeah. th and there has been some press coverage saying that it's vaccines gone. don't help you at all. Right. So and I that's think not that, true. And as we'll see in a moment, in fact, if you don't go in the hospital, you're pretty good with right. regards and vaccinated preventing long COVID. Anyway. I came um, away with the same impression from the paper as Brianne just articulated. You know, I, I would like, I would have liked to believe that vaccination would be a uh, hundred uh, percent preventative of long COVID. This paper says no, that's probably not the case. But uh, you know, mm. degree is hard to dissect out of out of this. Sure. Um, uh, and uh, fortunately, I've not seen the news reports on this. So yeah, you, it's good that you haven't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, reading but the fine print, how yeah. many of the people that had pulmonary sim symptoms or syndrome were smokers? Ah, that's a good question. Well, that's another because interesting. Yeah, the uh, the veterinary hospital's biggest problem, hmm. uh, the vet the vet hospital, not the veterinarian hospital. <laughs> the vet, <yeah. laughs> VA. The returning the returning troops from Afghanistan and other places, Iraq and Iran, not Iran, but uh, some other places also. Their biggest problem once they went in the hospital is to try to stop smoking. Mm, yeah. Right. But then the, the question is, is that percentage different in the control group than in the group who yeah. got uh, infected after vaccination? Well, that's, that's, we, that's basically what And that, that's a whole other. Yeah, we don't have those. That's a whole yeah. other. That's right. <laughs> you can't derive that from just general hospital records because the other information isn't given. Okay. Um, so I, I, I know what you're saying, Rich and Brianne. However, in the discussion, they say, we have to do more than vaccinate because obviously vaccination is not enough. All right. And so they really are a bit alarmist there. And they say, basically, we need to boost more often and we need to wear face masks. And <laughs> you can't do that forever. Anyway, next, next bit of data. Compared to the control group, there's an increased risk of death. At least one PASC and organ involvement in people who were not immunocompromised before PVI. The risks were generally higher in those who were immunocompromised. So a good fraction of these patients have immunosuppressive uh, conditions of various sorts, and they're the ones who have the more serious PASC. People with PVI had showed that the risks of death, at least one PASC, and organ system involvement were consistently higher in people who were immunocompromised versus those who were not. So... That's another risk factor, right? So it's not mm -hmm. the general population again. It's a very specific population. And uh, among people with PVI, they looked at vaccine type. There's no difference in the risk of uh, post-acute death among the three SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, the two mRNA and the Janssen vaccines. Okay. Yeah, but I think, I, yeah, and figure two, though, is is the one that for me is really the key. <laughs> figure two, risk in six-month excess burden uh, in those yeah. with PVI by acute phase care setting, yeah. Yeah, so basically they broke down um, the severity of the infection. Yes. Um, did you have uh, That's it. An, a SARS-CoV-2 infection that didn't put you in the hospital versus one that made you hospitalized yeah. versus one that yeah. put you in the ICU. And if you had a very severe um, 
COVID infection or SARS-CoV-2 infection, you were more likely to have at least one of these post-acute yeah. sequelae. Um, and so we do know that vaccination tends to prevent that severe infection. Right. And we know that severe infection, and this says that severe infection is more frequently associated with a post-acute sequelae. And so in that case, you can say, well, then vaccination should be reducing these ICU numbers um, and thus reducing the number of people who are at this high risk. It's not a hundred percent. Right. But um, that's right. So the figure is yeah. beautiful because they say non-hospitalized and those, the, the hazard ratio for PASC is very close to one. And in fact, some of the error bars overlap one. And then if yeah. you look at hospitalized or ICU patients, it's way to the right, three or higher, right? So yes, vaccines maybe prevent 80% of severe of hospitalization and, and ICU, but that's 20%. And I can totally imagine that in those people, they have long-term effects. Yeah. Uh, I'm just running the numbers on this. I don't know if they say it in the text, but uh, by my calculation, the fraction of the total PVI individuals that are non-hospitalized is 87%. So the vast majority were not hospitalized. Right. And had hazard ratios of close to one. Right. All right, so this, uh, the figure basically summarizes what's in the next section. So compared to the control group, uh, people who were not hospitalized during the first 30 days of PVI it had an increased ri risk of death. Hazard ratio 1.29 and the range is 1.12 to 1.49. Risk increased in those who are hospitalized, hazard ratio 2.69, and the highest in those admitted to the ICU, 5.68. So, yeah, you go, and Daniel has said this, you go in the ICU, you're going to have long-term consequences on that ventilator. There's no question. Although, interestingly, it's not the case with influenza, as we'll see. It's not zero with influenza. It's just less than for SARS-CoV-2 for some reason. So it's 2% of the uh, PVIs in the ICU. And it's... Uh, hang on, three... Uh, 10% uh, in that are hospitalized, yeah. not in the ICU. So a total of... My, my numbers don't all add up, but it's close. So those were death. And then for having one post-acute sequela, again, non-hospitalized people, 1.25. Hospitalized, 2.95. ICU, 3.75. So again, one of, one, at least one of these sequela goes up. So they say people who are not hospitalized exhibit small but significant increased risk, risk of post-acute sequelae. And it goes up if you're hospitalized or in the ICU. So... I think it makes sense, and it's not <laughs> the vast majority. And this this is in an, a population where the average age is what sixty six, and if you're younger, the vet, the, they're going to have even better protection, right? So this is not a population wide. Yeah, it would be really interesting to know um, if you look at, at non hospitalized yes. people in this age group versus in other age groups. Exactly. Do exactly. you see the same um, hazard ratio right. or does it actually come back down to one? Now, what about if you got SARS-CoV-2 infection but never vaccinated? Yeah, so I want to go through, I, I, again, I get twisted around by the cohorts here. They had 163,000 people who tested positive uh, after January, between January 1st and October 31st. Of those... 33,000 had been vaccinated and 113,000 had not. So we're comparing uh, infections in the vaccinated versus mm -hmm. the unvaccinated. So this is basically addressing right. the question that interests me the most, which is, does the vaccination uh, impact uh, long COVID, right? Yeah. And the answer is yes. The so answer is yes. People who are vaccinated and have PVI, so PVI by definition is vaccinated. Yes. Lower risk of death. The hazard ratio is 0.66. <laughs> Lower risk of post-acute sequelae, 0.85. And in all the organ systems, these various uh, post-acute sequelae, always lower in people with PVI versus uh, people who are not vaccinated and who were infected. So there's a 
yeah, vaccination works, right? The yeah, army knows that already, by the way. And with, you know, the all, all all the movies in the world that you see um, of the beginning of uh, a person's experience in the service. What's the first thing you see? He signs up with his thing. The next thing you see, he's getting shots like crazy in his butt, right? There's a big line of naked guys, and they're all getting vaccinated. What happened to these people? Uh, well, the, this was starting, I think the study started, when was the vaccine approved? Uh, uh, December 2020, I think. Is that right? You know, the exactly. point is, Rich, when these guys start showing up at the hospital for other reasons, they should all get vaccinated against SARS-CoV-2. Yeah. So there shouldn't be anybody in the other group. I agree. Here's my point. Now, I go to the page in Nature where this article is. And then on the right-hand column, it says associated content. Here's an article, a commentary. The title is, Long COVID Risk Falls Only Slightly After Vaccination. Huge study shows. That's not right. Correct. Right? It's not right, as we have just and, said. And how many of these people who caught it outside the hospital and then came in for their reason gave it to everybody else? And you can imagine how this thing spread so rapidly. In the vet, the the veterans' hospitals are always under scrutiny and always under revision, and they're always changing the heads, and they're always giving. They're trying to get more funding for them, and they never do. Mm. And they're operating at a second-class citizen. They're free, of course, for anybody that's had military service. So that's a good reason for going. But um, this is very disturbing for me as a. As an individual, my son served in the Air Force. My father was a Marine. And um, my guess is that they never had a choice as to whether they got a vaccine or not. They all got it. And that's hmm. this is crazy. I mean, you don't need TWIV to tell the Army. <laughs> if you want more troops in the field that are not sick, uh, I think you should vaccinate them. What but do you think? Don't, don't, doesn't, don't the armed forces have final say? If you're not vaccinated, they, they do. Goodbye, they right? do. Right, but, these are, but, these are, but these are vets. Um, doesn't matter. So the, right, but yeah, these are, no, point. it does matter yeah. because these people are potentially people who are not necessarily serving anymore. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. These might be that. old individuals who have served in the right. past. Yes. Yeah. I'm not sure that you can compel no, you're right. someone who served in Vietnam. No, 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 you're right. It's now, exactly. they, they can say, look, this is a veteran's hospital. We have our rules, and here are the rules. Well, I'm, I'm, the I don't think you can you do that. You vaccinated, and then you can come as a patient. No, you, you can't put that kind of um, qualification well, on they do care. for health care workers in all the hospitals. I think, though, this is correct. If you're not acting, <laughs> if you're not in active service, you, you can't right. push it. Yeah. Yeah. See, I look That's at this paper and I say, hmm. So I've learned that vaccines definitely help, but are not yes, perfect. But we knew that. And I think that that's what I thought beforehand. <laughs> so I'm good. So mm -hmm. then, last bit of data influenza. How does you get a, a people hospitalized with seasonal influenza? I don't know. They don't break this down by vaccine status, right? For influenza. They just say hospitalized for. Seasonal influenza. Anyway, the, they say compared to people who hospitalized with seasonal influenza, they compare the people with PVI who were hospitalized. They have those people, the PVI people have an increased risk of death hazard ratio 2.43 and increased risk of having at least one post acute sequela 1.27. So 1.27 means there's already post-acute influenza stuff going on, right? That's, it's uh, just one, higher. That's 1.27 in the flu group? No, 1.27 is the PVI group compared okay. to flu. So flu is not zero either, right? You do have post-acute sequela okay. for influenza, but it's not really commented on here. It's just they say it's higher in uh, SARS-CoV-2 patients with PVIs. Well, it's too bad that, well, I guess they can't, they're, they're stuck with it. it that these sort of uh, qualitative yeah, sure. uh, descriptors are used uh, for stuff where you really need the data. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
you know, the if I just look at the bottom line here, the uh, uh, try and pick out one of these one, at least one post acute sequela in the PVI group compared to the contemporary control. The hazard ratio is 1.5, 50% more likely mm. than, you know, the run-of-the-mill person in your cohort to have one of these. And compared to the vaccine group, it's uh, at least one post-acute uh, sequela negative, yeah. or it's 0.86, okay? So you're less likely. It's, it's not dramatic. I mean, you could call that... Um, I forget slight. what description they use. You could call that slight. Uh, it's much handier to have the number. What's impressive to me is that across the board, uh, all of these are hazard ratios of less than one. If you look at each individual symptom and yeah. death and et cetera, there's For none the that are greater. It's clear, clear that the vaccine is doing something, okay? It's not 100%, okay? I wish it was. It's not. That's what you come away with from the paper. Well, the... The problem is it's never going to be 100%, yeah. right? And it's never going to prevent infection unless you boost every four months, right? <laughs> and right. you're always going to, and especially in an older cohort, you're going to have more severe disease. So you're, I don't see how you prevent this. I mean, what they say in the discussion, the results show that although vaccination may partially reduce the risk of post-acute sequelae to most optimally reduce this burden requires continued emphasis on primary prevention of PVI as a goal of public health policy. And Paul Offit says that is not the goal of vaccination. Are we going to do something different here uh, for, well, it for COVID? It depends on what you think that something different is. Like where, if you're saying, should we all wear masks every day, 24 seven for the rest of our lives? Right. That's probably no. But the um, virus is not going away, so right, that's right. but and, and but should people who go into the VA who are in this high risk group maybe wear a mask on their way to the VA, particularly if they have respiratory symptoms? Eh, might not be the worst idea. If they <laughs> uh, have respiratory symptoms and they uh, uh, test pot and they go to see what they've got and test positive for SARS-CoV-2, some Paxlovid might be in order. Yeah. If you test positive, should you stay home? Yeah, it's probably not a bad idea. <laughs> None of these well, are bad ideas, Brian. Wait, wait, if who, if, Brian, if who <laughs> tests positive, uh, should you so stay if, home? If, I would say if someone tests positive for SARS-CoV-2, should they decide not to like, I don't know, go to a party? I don't, I'm not totally against that. Well, what about I don't want to wear you, a mask for the rest of my day, for the rest of my life, but I'm okay with being a little cautious sometimes. Yeah, but what about, we don't do that for influenza. Right, I know. Uh, are we going to do that forever? You're going to test positive because the virus is not going away, right? Right. And unless our estimate of long COVID is overestimated, maybe it doesn't go beyond three or four years, who knows, right? Right. Which would be great. But I don't see any vaccine on the horizon preventing infection, so... And Maybe it, it's just because I want to, if I test positive, I want an excuse to stay home and read a book. I think that if you are <laughs> over 65, you should take these data into consideration and behave accordingly, right? If you are worried about these long symptoms, wear a mask for sure. Um, I think that's perfectly reasonable. Uh, but I think the idea of testing positive and staying home, we don't even know if testing positive means you're transmitting, right? That's an, an unknown. So, But I still want to stay home and read a book. Or you could do TWIV. <laughs> Would you do TWIV still? Yeah, you can still do sure. TWIV. Sure. Sure. I'm home. And, uh, I want more <laughs> analysis of, of PASC for influenza. I want to see exactly... Uh, the extent of it and how long it lasts, because we have more of a history of influenza, right? To get maybe. I want to know what causes PASC. <sighs> macrophages, dude. <laughs> macrophages. <laughs> Wasn't it uh, inflammasome activation in macrophages? Yeah. And that was it. Maybe it's also antibodies to interferons, right? Maybe. Hey, they should take these patients with PASC and see if they have autoantibodies to interferon, right? Anyway, yes, I want to know what causes it too. 
and then maybe you can prevent it, right? But I do think it's a very squishy thing. I don't want to sound negative, but asking people if they feel tired, you could, I mean, some people who got COVID, yeah, they feel tired for a long time. I know. Um, but how long is it going to last? We're only a few years out, right? Anyway, I thought that would be interesting to speak, to talk about. And it was very interesting to talk about. Thank you for your involvement. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> Uh, it is 4.30. Um, let's see. I want to read one email because we don't want to read more than one, but I do think uh, one. the first one is important. Brianne, can you read that first one? Sure. Nestia writes, Dear TWIV team, I am an AAV engineer at Caltech, and I've been an avid listener since a professor recommended the podcast two years ago. Your banter has kept me company through many dissections and made me feel connected to the greater scientific community. You guys are the central nervous system of the virology tribe. Oh, I like that. <laughs> Thank you for the incredible service you do for science and scientists alike. I am writing not with a virology question, but with a request to the virology community at large. I and several other Ukrainian-born scientists, postdocs, and professors have recently formed a nonprofit organization, Scholars for Ukraine. Our aim is to raise money among our colleagues around the world and send it to small, carefully vetted volunteer groups in the worst affected areas in Ukraine. We focus on providing food and medical supplies to civilians on the front lines, niches that larger organizations seldom manage to reach in time. We ask you to please consider supporting our cause through a donation. Even a small amount goes a long way. For more information, please visit, um, and she gives a website for this organization. Someday TWIV will have the opportunity to visit Ukrainian virology institutes under a peaceful sky. Until then, we humbly ask this wonderful community for help. Yours truly, Nestia. Great. Excellent. And I would love to do a TWIV in Ukraine one day. That would be fun. Yeah. Actually, Rich, can you take the next one? <laughs> uh, yeah, I was going to, if we didn't do that, I was going to ask you to send me Dan's email. Sure. Uh, please do so. Dan writes, dear Twiv, hi Twiv folks, longtime lurker of both the Twim and Twiv podcasts, the mere mention of Torts paper in episode 898 brought back a flood of memories. That was about the uh, 1915 paper about the discovery of bacteriophage. I have had an appreciation for our bacterial virus friends since learning more about them in my early uh, college days. My undergrad degree is in microbiology and phage research became one of the few long-term topics I follow today. Even though my career has long since shifted away, um, as I look, sure, shifted away as I work in food and beverage quality, brewing, alcohol, but some non-alcoholic non as well. I still love to re-examine old works as I try to keep up with new work between current career-related learning. I would, uh, uh, I have had success buying and obtaining copies of De Harrell's work, but not much of tort would uh, Dr. Condit uh, <laughs> be able to share a copy. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, I understand uh, if not, I understand if not, as it seems he was able to obtain one through a friend. Yes, I got a copy through a friend. I'd be happy I'll to I'll send you his email. Yeah. Uh, on to wider praise. Thank you, Twiv team, for all the work you put in, especially in the last two years. I am happy non-COVID topics are being sprinkled back in, but the help during the pandemic bringing uh, out forgotten knowledge, providing new information was extremely helpful. More than a few times, I have had conversations about COVID policies in offices and manufacturing environments. The nuance gained was useful and very appreciated, even, uh, uh, even when it meant I had to jump into a few hours of research to confirm a position after the kid went to sleep. Uh, cheers to you all with whatever beverage you prefer. Best wishes, Dan. <laughs> Good. Uh, Dixon, can you take the next one? I sure can. Rowan writes... Hi, team. It's 11.3C here in Armadale, New South Wales, Australia. We're in the middle of the lead up to an election between our version of Trump and a more serious politician. Hopefully we can get the current team out and have some action on climate, COVID, economics, and so on. Anyway, on episode 898, you had a listener letter about a point being uh, an infinitesimal 
a concept from mathematics, concept from mathematics, and therefore saying a data point was not correct. I wanted to throw in my two cents and say that the same word means something different depending on the context. The point of a knife is definitely not infinitesimal, nor is the point of an argument or the point of a policy. In the case of a point of data, we are generally referring to a single record, a single value within a table, or a single recording. In these ways, a point really means a single discrete sample rather than a trend or a conclusion. A plurality of points goes into the data and can then be analyzed to come to a conclusion. Hopefully, we can have someone in the prime ministership who can see what the point of the office is and stop <laughs> attacking trans kids, alienating allies, and funneling cash to friends. Thanks for the awesome show. Rowan. I love the way the show brings brings out the pedants in the crowd. This I is like great. Absolutely. I, like that. Absolutely. I, agree. I agree with Rowan. I think it's... <laughs> yes. It's, you could say that. A, actually, <laughs> yes. It's actually a good analysis. I yeah, and I too. couldn't... I didn't come up with an argument, but this yeah. is perfect. I really like this. All right. Jeff writes, hello, Twivers. In Twiv898, you read a letter from Charles asking whether vaccination provides short-term sterilizing immunity and whether there may be reduced seroconversion rates. Coincidentally, I was researching this seroconversion question this week and found some results from the Moderna Phase three vaccine trials. Ah, they concluded as follows, quote, among participants in the mRNA-1273 vaccine efficacy trial with PCR-confirmed COVID-19, anti-nucleocapsid, uh, I have to pause, I'm sorry, Moderna. It's PCR-confirmed COVID or infection? PCR-confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection. Yeah. Okay. Anti-nucleocapsid antibody seroconversion at the time of study on blinding, median 53 days post-diagnosis, 149 days post-enrollment, occurred in 40% of the mRNA vaccine recipients versus 93% of the placebo recipients, a significant difference. Higher SARS-CoV-2 viral copy number upon diagnosis was associated with a greater chance of anti-nucleocapsid antibody seropositivity. Odds ratio 1.9 per one log increase, interval 1.59 or 2.28. All infections analyzed occurred prior to the circulation of Delta and Omicron viral variants. And he provides a link to the preprint that's interesting. So the suggestion is that, yes, um, vaccination blunts your anti-nucleocapsid response, right? Yes. Yeah. Which we didn't know at the time that Charles wrote. But thank you, Jeff, for – and I love crowdsourcing this. Um, well, you know, you got to be careful. I just read that book, um, The Death of Expertise. And it, one of the main points is just because a crowd believes something doesn't mean it's true. <laughs> but this is the case where the research has been done. So, um, and, you know, another thing from that book, which is really good. You know, a democracy means everybody gets one vote. It doesn't mean everybody's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's time for some picks. Dixon, what do you have for us? Well... <laughs> the thousand-year drought in the West is uh, culminating in a um, a critical situation on Lake Mead because Lake Mead not only supplies water for drinking and for irrigation, but also for hydroelectric power. And it's about the level of the lake is now 90% within the turbines that take the water in for the water to turn the turbines. Hmm. Meaning that should it go down another 10%, the dam can no longer function as a hydroelectric dam. In addition, the water use has been a mess because crops have been failing for other reasons rather than just a drought. So in order to allocate water from an already um, crippled system, we'll probably keep the state legislatures of Colorado, California, Arizona, New Mexico, and, um, well, maybe Utah, <clears throat> busy. And they'll be arguing for years before they realize that even if they had decided something, it's no use anymore because there's no more water. 
you should take a look at this picture. Mm. And the white zone along the, the shoreline, yeah. that's where the water used to be. I see, yeah. It's really, really severe. And it may stay that way forever. That's the true definition of climate change. It's not a weather pattern that's causing this. It's climate. This uh, graph is impressive. Yeah, the graph too. Yes. Yeah. Yes. All, all of this is really sad. Yes, exactly right. All right, so Dixon, when, what, what's the outcome? Water restrictions? That's going to, you know, there are, that's, no. When you don't have water, you can restrict anything you want. <laughs> and it doesn't really matter because there isn't enough water right now to even if they reapportioned it to supply water for everybody. Mm -hmm. And people are still flocking to those places because they're great retirement communities. So mm. it's tragedy. And Lake Powell, which is the next one up, this is the largest um, reservoir in, <clears throat> pardon me, in New York, in um, the Northern Hemisphere. And Lake Powell is the second largest reservoir. And they're both fed by the Colorado. And it's a situation which everybody knew would happen when they watched. If this is a thousand-year drought, tell me they didn't want to. They didn't know this would happen already. Yeah, of course they knew. And remember what the um, the ethic of the um, short-term politician is: do it until you can't. Mm -hmm. If it if it's not broken, we're going to not try to fix it because it's still working, even though we know it's broken. But it's not going to break right now. And so they're playing these little games of pretending that, well, you know, we've, and you asked me what to do. If I was in charge of this whole thing, I'd just shut the whole thing down. Just wait for it to fill back up again. And in some years, it actually did. But <clears throat> you're going to have to start farming in another way. Well, I'm a big fan of that other method, but. Uh, that would save a tremendous amount of this water, by the way, if they were to convert a lot of their farming to vertical or indoor or mm -hmm. some kind of controlled environment agriculture, they could save 70% of what they use out of this reservoir. That 70%, if you look at it, that's drinking water. It's hydroelectric power. It's And the other thing is, of course, those communities that are dependent on this water, why don't they recycle their water? So the, 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 the city of Las Vegas not only recycles its water, the water that gets purified to drinking water quality is put into Lake Mead. So Las Vegas is making a contribution where they don't want to go out of business. And they uh, had a show last night on one of the news shows, the Hotel Bellagio. The uh, gigantic fountains that go up with all these wonderful time sprays and everything. Well, that water is recycled. That's every bit of it is recycled. So that's the that's the other secret. Don't throw away gray water. Recycle it. Mm. And these are simple, like wear a mask, take uh, you know social distance, get yourself vaccinated. There are those are simple things to do here too. And uh, at a global level, nobody's doing them. Because well, somebody's ox is being gored when you do it. Dixon, you know, business doesn't like to pay more. That's the bottom <coughs> line, right? So they don't want to do these things. Exactly. But at some point they will have to. Well, I hope they start, uh, the voters start paying attention to who's doing and who's not doing. No, they, they because, won't. They will not pay attention. Because they listen okay, to you. whoever they believe and they hear what they want to hear. And There is there's nothing we can do then. I'm very pessimistic. I noticed, <laughs> uh, but not of not about Twiv. I'm very bullish. No, of no, Twiv. no, I understand. <laughs> I understand. That's very sad, Dixon. It is. I didn't think that the solution is. There are solutions, as you say. There um, are solutions, but they have to really get on the stick. They really have to get on the stick. All right, Brian. What do you have for us? So I have something that is a cool uh, tech use. Maybe it will be a little more um, positive uh, <laughs> feeling for us. Um, so this is actually a story about a transplantation um, of an ear that was made uh, for a person who was born basically um, without much of an ear. Um, and this 
air was actually 3D printed using human cells to match what they had um, originally um, and was the first sort of case of such a um, 3D printed um, ear like this that was then used for transplantation. Um, It's the beginning of a clinical study that, um, so it's not yet published. Um, There will be more um, of this done and then there'll be a publication. Um, But just the idea that you could 3D print with human cells and actually make organs is pretty cool. Uh, Yes, I'm having having difficulty uh, conceptualizing this. (laughs) (laughs) Am I actually using some sort of a device to yes. deposit to deposit cells in yes. a particular architecture. Yes. Rawr. So if if you're looking at the article, um, the if you look at the photo at the top, that was what the person's ear looked like before. On the left. On the left. Yes. And that was examined, and places where new tissue were needed were figured out, and a unique 3D printed tissue that matched and fit with that tissue that the person already had was generated with a 3D printing device and then transplanted. And you can see the result on the right. Right. But she doesn't have an ear canal, right? It looks like she doesn't have an ear canal. Yeah, so it's just Um, a cosmetic thing. But it's a cosmetic thing, but still. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's cool. For sort of the beginning of this kind of technology, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah, as you can imagine, yeah, agree. Pre- 3D printing other body parts, like, it's amazing. Cool. Crazy. Thank you. Rich, what do you have for us? Okay, first, uh, I have a little public service thing, because um, uh, in TWIV 900, uh, which I think uh, was coincident with smallpox vaccination day, I picked an article called Smallpox Vaccination Techniques from Knives and Forks to Needles and Pins by uh, Derek Baxby, Uh, but it was behind a paywall. I contacted Vaccine, and they have temporarily lifted the paywall on that. Right. So you can, uh, until the end of June, if you want to go back, and we can can repost uh, this link and have a look at that article, you can. And uh, I'd like everybody to do that so that vaccine can see the impact of TWIV. <laughs> so uh, there you go. That's very that, cool. That link is now live. You I had also, better luck. You had better luck because I did a New England Journal pick about how doctors being right and wrong. I said they should be open access. They didn't do it for me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I sent them the same uh, gripe as we were doing that. And they acknowledged receiving my email, but I haven't seen anything further than that. Okay, uh, my actual picks, uh, I have uh, two uh, uh, nested picks again. One is called uh, an article uh, in, uh, I think it's uh, New England Journal of Medicine. Mm -hmm. It's a short commentary or review called, it's commentary really, called Understanding Vaccine Safety and the Roles of the FDA and CDC by a Dr. H. Cody Meissner who I believe is at Tufts. He's a pediatrician. And this is just sort of a PSA, if you like. It's a very nice, concise description of how the FDA and the CDC go about approving vaccines uh, and uh, how the safety considerations play into that, okay? Because there's a lot of misinformation out there about vaccine safety and the role of government in... um, um, assuring vaccine safety and et cetera. And this, this is the truth, this short article. Uh, but reading that had me poking around to find out about H. Cody Meissner, a name I was not familiar with, and what else he has published. And he's uh, uh, got quite a few publications in the same vein, one called Facts About Vaccine Safety that has a nice table in it that summarizes uh, that the, the article talks about uh, various incidents like the most prominent, the Cutter incident, um, uh, of uh, failures in vaccine safety and what we learned from them and what has been done about it. And it's a nice summary of those, uh, co-authored with uh, Stanley Plotkin. So, nice. two quick articles about vaccine safety. If you want Excellent. the facts, Rich, there you go. Did you actually say in the same vein and then talk about a vaccine article? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it happens. Thank you. All right. My, I want to get my pick. Hold on a second. All right. This has nothing to do with science, but I've been looking for a, a good backpack for many years, and I finally found it. I, was, I recently went to uh, Zurich, and the backpacks I've had before are too big. You put them under the seat, and you can't fit your feet in. I don't need to carry that much. All I want is to carry my laptop. So I found this little backpack, which uh, this is for a 15-inch. It's really thin and really light. It's got a main compartment for a backpack. It's padded. And then there's a little thing on the front where you can put your charger and some notebooks, whatever. Not a lot. Uh, it's thin, though. I mean, it's really thin and light. So I'm going to give you a link for that. On Amazon, it's called the um, Bopai. So it comes 15 inch and bigger. But this is great. And I took it to Zurich and now I'm bringing it to the incubator every day because it's so light. Like Every other backpack I've had is too heavy. And this great. fits under the front seat of an airplane seat. No problem. So I'm very happy and I wanted to share it with you. By the way, I also got new luggage tags. You can get these with your initial on them. <laughs> Any initial in the alphabet, different colors. They're really cool. They're sturdy and metal thing that holds on really tightly. I can't tell you how many luggage tags I've lost. You know, I see them floating around on the baggage thing, you know, <laughs> they come off and so forth. So that's very cool. Three, it's about three inches deep, this backpack. Very cool. So I'm very excited about it. That's why I wanted to share it with you. And we have a listener pick today from Greg. Hi, TWIV team. Thank you for all your good work. Professor Racaniello has mentioned the book, The Death of Expertise by Tom Nichols in at least one TWIV episode and in his Richard Ernst lecture. I mentioned it today too. Along the same lines, I would like to recommend the podcast Against the Rules by Michael Lewis, author of several best-selling books such as Moneyball and The Big Short. The third and most recent season of this podcast series focuses on how and why expertise tends to be underappreciated. He provides examples of one, large organizations in which people with critical expertise often work six layers down from the top. Two, experts who are focused on solving a problem but not boasting or claiming credit. And three, experts who are overlooked because they are female. In the first season of this series, Lewis did a couple of episodes on how sports umpires and referees have also suffered from declining trust, even though they have much better training and tools than in the past. There may be some relevant parallels to the distrust of scientists. Michael Lewis is an expert and compelling storyteller. Against the Rules with Michael Lewis on Apple Podcasts. Yeah, so this expertise issue is a problem because people, th as the, the Democratic issue I mentioned before. People think uh, I could be right. And if they read something in an hour, they, they become an expert on something. And it's not true. You can't. Okay. And I'm sorry, you can believe you're an expert, but you're not. There's nothing like many, many years of working in a field uh, to be an expert. And unfortunately, many aspects of um, our society have caused this problem. It's not just the internet, but it's also colleges and universities. You read read uh, <laughs> the death of expertise. It's it lays it all out beautifully, and uh, that's why someone who has never worked with a virus can have two million followers on YouTube talking about viruses, and we only have one hundred and ten thousand. And you know, we <laughs> collectively have worked over a hundred years on viruses, so that's the problem we have. <laughs> So thank you, Greg. I will check that out. Sounds good. Have you read Moneyball? Have not. Good book. Have you seen the movie? M Moneyball and The Big Short are actually both yeah. pretty interesting movies. Um, and What's Moneyball um, so about? Baseball. It's about uh, the, uh, the uh, Oakland, Oakland A's Athletics. going from the, from the cellar to a first-rate team by, by basically, I forget quite, what it involves, but basically it's, ignoring the statistics. statisticians. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, looking at different statistics. statistics. Looking at different statistics, right. Well, yeah, sabermetrics. And, and don't forget Brad Pitt stars in the movie, so that's a big okay. that's a big plus. Oh, yeah, that's right. The, different <laughs> statistics. It's looking at, I, uh, I'd have to read it again, but it's what's very against, interesting. Uh, what's against the rules about? I think that's the podcast. That's the oh, podcast. Sorry, no, so, the, the, he's the author of 
The yeah. big, big short. Volleyball. No, what's the big short? What's that? Um, the big short is a. I've only seen the movie. Um, it is about the financial crisis. Yeah. Okay. Very great. Right. All right. Uh-huh. Thank you, Greg. Greg's from Illinois. That'll do it for TWIV 906. Show notes, microbe.tv slash TWIV. You can send us your questions, comments, picks. TWIV at microbe.tv. Many of you send them to Vincent at microbe.tv. You shouldn't do that unless you want to talk to just me, which is fine. But <laughs> don't send general TWIV questions or comments or picks there because... They won't ever make it because it's, uh, I have to make separations. You know, it's hard. <laughs> Twiv at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, consider supporting us. We would love your support. Uh, that's how we do all this. And uh, you can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. We have a number of ways by which you can support us. And whatever you choose, we're very appreciative. And it's also U.S. federal tax deductible because we are a nonprofit Entity. Dixon de Pommiers at trichinella.org, the living river.org. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent, and everybody else. Um, you know, I'm, I should be writing all this down. <laughs> what do you want to write down? <laughs> Everything we discussed today, because it was, we covered a long, a lot of different things, but you can go back. It's, it's a podcast. You can uh, listen to it. Clinical studies. Yeah, I know. That's it, yeah. true. That's true. And you can. The clinical studies are fraught. They are. All difficult. the things that we brought well, up today. So this one is an observational study. It's not a, it's not a double blind placebo no, controlled trial where you can control yeah. variables. Here exactly. there are other, there may be other confounding variables that you don't know about. So you cannot oh, no, make. There has to be. There has to be. There just has anyway, to be. But you can also get a transcript at YouTube because YouTube automatically transcript. makes transcripts. How about true. that? But I learn more when I take notes. <laughs> yeah, note taking is good. Do you do it on paper, Dixon? Uh, what else? <laughs> well, we have uh, an intern here at uh, the incubator. Her name is Hannah. She's a master's student at NYU. And she came by yesterday and we were talking about things to do. And uh, she took notes on an iPad with a little stencil. <laughs> really? Well, that's that, that is what I do. And I love it. What that's program great. do you use, Brianne? Um, sometimes I use um, one called Good Notes, I think. Good Reader or Good Reader? I think it was called, I think it's Good Notes. Good I'll notes, have to look okay. back at what it is. Yeah, I just never got into it. Uh, I, I tried and didn't really like it. And then I got a newer iPad that had the Apple Pencil and the Apple Pencil is what made the difference for me. Uh, all right. I do like paper. I, I love different kinds of pads. Yeah, paper, I like paper. The only problem is it's hard to search, right? Well, you can't. I don't know how to write anymore. <laughs> you don't? <laughs> no, I start writing and I, it's just my hand goes all wonky. I don't write well anymore because I don't have a lot of practice. It's yeah. true. Exactly. But, you know, there's nothing like a good pen and paper. I would agree. Rich Conda is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville. He is currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. And Brianne Barker is at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. And I'll make sure that you uh, try out my iPad at ASV. Yeah, it'd be <laughs> cool. Very good. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>